of you know Joanna? Hi. Oh. I, I thought there might be even more because um, she has an American accent, but here's the deal. She's a baroness <laughs> and a British citizen. And I was saying to you, you said that's, she's probably the only, quote, self-made American baroness ever, correct? I think I'm the only American serving in the House of Lords, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to let you know this background because of your, your, you seem like an American. She grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, yeah. St. Mary's. Yes. Um, went to Penn State, got an MBA from GWU, and then proceeded to get leadership positions in top Silicon Valley companies. I mean, we're talking Google, uh, Facebook, on and on and on. Yeah. <laughs> but in the course of that incredible career, you started having some doubts about tech being utopia. You had some concerns. Can you walk us through that journey a little bit and the moments that made you start to have some concerns about it? Well, I've been, um, I went to Silicon Valley in the late 1980s. I drove up in my car. Everything I owned was packed in the car. And, um, you know, fresh MBA and really idealistic and started out in chips and eventually um, got into um, streaming audio and video, worked at Real Networks and, you know, started to see the potential and the promise of internet technologies and, you know, social media, streaming media. Um, like you said, I had some really great experiences where I happened to be in the right place at the right time. But we worked pretty hard, by the way, <laughs> to get there. But, you know, I, I joined a few really exciting companies and, you know, was able to become, you know, a team player and executive team player in some of the rising companies like Google and Facebook. So I saw the Internet revolution, um, you know, in its earliest days and its most optimistic times. And, you know, I was a real believer, a real utopian and believer in that it was going to empower us, you know, and... and give democratize access to information and opportunity and really transform the world, which to be fair, it has. But there were times um, in the last couple of years, you know, I, I, I joined government five years ago to build the Tech City Initiative. And, uh, you know, in the past couple of years, it became clear that, you know, there were cracks beginning to show in this, this narrative that, you know, the digital revolution was so wonderful for everyone because realistically there were all kinds of problems. So one of the problems I started working on was um, child sexual exploitation online. Because you can imagine if somebody wants to take advantage of a child, you know, all the time our children spend, you know, with their devices unsupervised, it just became an explosion of abuse and exploitation. Yeah. And, you know, working in social media and, you know, you realize that, you know, this becomes a conduit for that. So suddenly you have an entirely new social problem that, you know, people hadn't even thought about or even understood. And, and you talked to me backstage. You used to, you know, in Silicon Valley, you talk about users. Yeah. And it started dawning on you, and we're not talking about users. We're talking about people yeah. and their lives and the impact on their lives and their children. And, yeah. you know, the, you, you mentioned the, um, the, the Arab uprising, the Arab Spring, excuse me, and, you know, how that unleashed it. It was great, unleashed all these forces, yeah. but then, then what? Well, I mean, you know, when you connect almost half the world's population um, on various platforms, which are pretty much ubiquitous now, um, you have this potential to reach everyone, but you also have um, algorithms that amplify passion. So if, um, if I'm really passionate about a particular candidate or cause, you know, I can find communities of people like me um, on those platforms. But what happens is you end up in this filter bubble where you're only hearing from those people. So you start to believe that your opinion is mainstream. So there's this asymmetry of passion, I call it, where you're really passionate about something and everyone you seem to meet in those spaces are just like you. So suddenly this, there's perception that, you know, things are not really as they seem, which is why, you know, we found that we find now that people are receptive to things like misinformation and fake news because they're only sharing it with people that are like them. Now, those algorithms are great when you're trying to serve the right ad to the right person at the right time. Right. But realistically, when, you know, you, when it ends up reinforcing bias and normalizing you know, hatred, it's, it becomes a really big issue. 
So you left a government post to join a company that is dedicated to AI, which raises, doesn't that raise some of the same concerns or similar concerns? What's going through your head well, about that? You know, I, I think that I say that the internet, the digital revolution was almost like a dress rehearsal, you know, for what's coming because artificial intelligence will, you know, change our lives in ways that we don't even really truly understand. I mean, I just came from um, a conference called Cognition X which is an AI festival. There's over 7,000 people there, and everyone's trying to you know, engage with this community and really understand w what has to be done to ensure that you have an ethical um, society where artificial intelligence is, is um, pervasive. Um, like right now, for instance, if you, um, all of your sort of credit history and your um, experiences, you know, your, um, your insurance and your claims and all that stuff becomes public information to someone. Right. And you can imagine if you went online and you tried to, we were just talking about insurance, if you went online and you tried to get an insurance policy and you didn't get it, well, you, you really wouldn't have any, if a machine is making that decision, that machine could decide that for whatever reason you're not worthy of that. And then you don't have any recourse. You don't have recourse. You know, and then suddenly, you know, you might have to get very expensive insurance and that affects your, you know, your livelihood. And so we could have a situation, that's just one example of where, you know, machines are making decisions about people, excluding us or exhibiting bias in a way that, you know, could really impact people's lives. And that's just one example. And so I want questions, start raising your hands. I want to bring in the audience. We Let's turn to the benevolent form yes. of AI and <laughs> medicine. Yes. What are the great potentials coming down the pike on that? Well, the, the one thing that's really exciting about artificial intelligence is how much data there is out there that's not being used or that's not being assembled in any meaningful way. So um, when you think about something like drug discovery, you know, there's a lot of immensely talented um, scientists in the world and companies working to find cures for diseases. Um, and treatments for disease, I should say, uh, drugs and treatments. But each researcher um, takes their unique experience and the knowledge that they have, and they can read as much as they possibly can, but there's no way they can, um, you know, assemble Assimilate all everything. that information and, and look for clues and patterns in that data that might, you know, give you a new indication that, or a new target or a new compound that might you know, lead to the next um, drug that comes out on the market. So what we're trying to do is we're taking all of the scientific data we can assemble. We're making sense of it, you know, creating logic and the algorithms around that to make it useful to researchers so that they can test hypotheses and, you know, um, look for faster ways to move um, these hypotheses to, to drugs to actually get them into the market. So we work on everything from data ingestion all the way to where you develop and test a drug. Questions about AI or innovation? Yes. Hi. 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 <laughs> nice to introduce you. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sigrid Johannesse. Uh, I'm a counselor for innovation at the Dutch Embassy in Washington. We uh, worked together in the past. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's an honor to see you here. Nice to see you. Um, the role of government is very important, I think, in this yeah. to manage AI into the, the right direction, whatever that might be. Consider your different backgrounds. What are your views on this topic? Well, you know, I think that you're absolutely right. So one of the things that um, happened at the end of last week is, is I noticed that Google announced that their AI principles, which I thought was a really welcome thing. Um, what they were saying is what their beliefs were and how they thought they would develop their products, you know, considering the concerns that, you know, societal concerns around artificial intelligence. And most importantly, they said they would, what they wouldn't do, what lines they would not cross. And that's a, that's a good development, but as you said, it's, it's not, not going to be down to one company, and it's also not going to be down to one government. So it's not one company, one organization, or government that has to look at this. It has to be um, all of these organizations coming together in some, some ways. Um, I think a good model is, is what we did um, around forming We Protect, which is, which is a global movement that I started. It's called the We Protect Global Alliance. And 
you know, we looked at the, the issue of child sexual exploitation and uh -huh. we said, you know, we can't solve this as one government. You know, we can't solve this even as, you know, you know, governments or allies. You have to actually have a global strategy and a global commitment. And that takes, you know, governments, NGOs, all kinds of tech companies, organizations, and a real um, strategy around how to address those issues. And I think that artificial intelligence is another one of those, you know, big developments that are too large for any one country or one company to address. So Joanna, your faith has informed a lot of moving in this direction of seeing both the potential and the downside of technology. Can you talk about that a bit? Well, I think I'd say um, I've always, you know, tried to live a life of uh, spiritual life. And um, as I said, you know, there were times when I just felt as though um, the the needs of the individual person were not being considered in in um, in the development of products and things. So I've always had this ethical framework whereby, you know, I would consider the needs of the um, the person you're developing a product for. Like for instance, again, in terms of internet safety, I always had safety by design in my mind when we would roll out or release a product. And you know, I just feel like that 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 tug of my spirituality has sort of pulled me back um, and helped me, you know, uh, informed sort of my decisions around uh, you know building out this global alliance. And I'm actually now um, working on something called the Child Dignity Alliance, which is um, in response. What is it? Yeah. Well, it's in response to um, we had a. Um, Child Dignity in the Digital World Summit last year at the Vatican, and Pope Francis came out with a, a, we came out with this Declaration of Rome, which he endorsed, and we're really busy trying to pull together, um, you know, um, all of the working groups that will try to make that a reality. So really, how do we protect the dignity of children in the digital age? And the Pope has raised that pretty consistently. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes. Hi. <coughs> Sorry. Hi. <coughs> Sorry. Claire Skinner from Hydrocon Struggles. You talked about um, the opportunities to connect half the world's population. I'm uh, interested in what you might think of the opportunities for AI for those people who are not yet connected oh, to the internet. Oh, that's an odd you think about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, first of all, you have to have the connection in order to really participate, and I think that we're not finished yet on that. I think, you know, half the world's population might be connected, but, you know, um, without that internet device, when you think about it, without that, you really have no opportunity. So you could easily see that, you know, um, people would be left out. So, you know, whatever you do beyond that is really difficult to empower them and give them opportunities, but I have seen artificial intelligence um, used in the area of food security and um, also sort of applications and things that will identify what crops to plant and when and, you know, the possibility of, um, of you know, um, weather-related yep. issues and how that might inform That's a perfect example decisions. of AI using, yes, yeah, at, in remote areas. So it's not yeah. really about their connection, but there would be like one mobile phone in a village that was getting yeah. that information yeah. and then you know, enabling that entire um, community to benefit from that. So we really, the, you still have to have the connection yeah. though. So I know you're brand new at this job, but where do you see AI helping most in medicine? Do you see it in, in and can you talk about particular di diseases or drugs or where are we gonna see the next leaps and bounds? Well, you know, um, we don't talk about particular drug programs, I think because until it, you reach the actual trial stage, you know, um, you don't want to talk about that because you don't want to give false hopes to patients. But um, we have talked about a lot of research projects that we're doing um, with um, ALS and um, Parkinson's and some other really, you know, difficult to treat treat diseases. And um, you know, I really have hope that the answer is out there, it's somewhere in the data, and you just have to find the right connections to make that happen. But I do firmly believe that there's 
still this strong need for human augmentation of the process of artificial intelligence. Like the, the interaction between the technology and the scientist is what is really inspiring to me. Because you, know, you can have the best tech in the world, but uh, if you don't have someone to interrogate those results and to use their brains to augment and feed back into that process, you know, that, that's where the magic happens. And you're cited when you talk, talk about ALS and so forth, um, these are neuro diseases yeah. that really are, have become very, very difficult nuts to crack. Is that, is that where you have the most hope right now? Yeah, I think, you know, those are, like I said, they're research projects at this point. You know, we're not at the stage where, but, um, but I do think that there's, I, the figure I, I've read is that there's 8,000 diseases that don't really have any treatment. So we've got a lot of work to do. 8,000. So Joanna, final words, what would you say to this audience about, um, and you said it to me backstage, about when you look at artificial intelligence, how should we be thinking about it? now that we've been through the digital age and we've seen the ups and the downs of that? Well, I think we have to have our eyes wide open. I think um, you know, the potential um, of artificial intelligence to transform our lives in so many ways, is, it's obvious. You read about it every day. You know, um, when you think about someone who's had a car accident and they can use um, augmented reality and you know, AI applications to understand how the, the human mind connects with an artificial limb, I mean, that's a really that's exciting a development. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, you know, or you can use artificial intelligence to monitor your body so that you might be informed that you could potentially suffer from a heart attack. I mean, that's incredible, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many positives, but we have to be um, cognizant of the fact that, um, you know, we have always been the creators of technology. But now this technology is so powerful that it creates itself. Right. And so you, know, you have to be wary of that and realize that, um, you know, understand that there will be things that you won't completely understand. Well, Joanna, that industry, AI, is lucky <laughs> to have you as a Thank moral you. compass. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.